Hey guys, so um, one of the best Catholic apologists uh, that I know of, uh, Dr. Doug Beaumont, who I've had on uh, Blue Collar and The Scholar in the past, had a pretty funny meme on his uh, YouTube channel. And it basically said, instead of saying Catholics worship Mary, you should stay. I don't understand Catholic teachings. And it went down a list, and, and one of them was, uh, instead of saying Catholics believe in earn, earning their salvation by works, you should say, I don't understand Catholic teaching. <laughs> and uh, speaking of blue collar and a scholar, I spoke to the, uh, I think it was the PR manager, public relations manager, of uh, probably the most influential, one of the greatest scholars in the last century, I spoke to his uh, PR manager uh, Friday about having him come on Blue Collar and a Scholar. It's a long shot uh, for various reasons. I won't get it into now because I want to get into this video. But if we get him on, uh, I'll be excited. If we don't get him on, I'll tell you who he was and what happened. But um, so today, I want to take one of those uh, m uh, parts of the meme where Protestant or evangelical brothers uh, don't understand Catholicism, that they think we earn our salvation. Because when I was a Protestant, that's how I viewed Catholicism, as a, as a false gospel, as a, another gospel that Catholics taught you how to earn your salvation by good works. So I'm going to explain to you using Catholic sources. See, when I was a Protestant, I read what Protestants said about Catholics. And then, as I grew in my faith, and I and, and I knew enough of the Bible exegetically, I could understand the Bible, and I knew church history. I dug into Catholic sources, their councils, their catechisms, went on the Vatican website, and this is what I'm gonna uh, share today. I'm gonna share with you official Catholic councils, uh, their catechism, and the Vatican website. <laughs> to show you what Catholics really believe about salvation, that yes, we do believe we're saved by grace alone. So, um, you know, Dr. Peter Crift, uh, one of many, many Protestants who came to the faith. I mean, in the past 50 years, in the past 50 years, the Catholic Church has doubled in size. And, and in the past 10 years, where all non-Catholic Christian denominations are declining in their membership. I just did a video. The Baptists, the Southern Baptists, lost over 450,000 members in the last three years. The United Methodist Church lost over 5,000 whole churches, broke away from the denomination. And then there's many ex-evangelicals uh, that are deconstructed, and, you know, famous preachers and, and Christian um, music artists saying they don't believe at all anymore. During this time, during this past 10 years, the Catholic Church has grown steadily. Every year we've seen an increase. In fact, we outpace the growth of the world population. In the past 10 years, um, the world population grew 9.2% and the Catholic Church grew 9.8%. And many, many in the last 50 years and the last 10 years were born again, Bible-believing, evangelical Protestant Christians who came to the Catholic faith like Presbyterian minister, Dr. Scott Hahn, Pentecostal, the late, the late Pentecostal preacher, Alex Jones, a Baptist, Steve Ray, Methodist preacher, Keith Nestor, many, many impressive Christians who knew their Bible very well became Catholic. I'm talking hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands. And many like me, like uh, Dr. Francis Beckwith, who was the president of the Evangelical Theological Society, a group of evangelical scholars. I mean, these are, these are Bible scholars. And he was the president when he came back. He was baptized like me, baptized Catholic, and then left the faith. And then as he grew in his faith and understanding the Bible, he came back to the Catholic Church. And that's what I was. I was a weak Catholic, didn't know my faith, you know, got excited about Jesus, had an experience with God. Uh, became an on fire, Bible believing, born again, blood bought, Holy Spirit filled Christian, and left the Catholic Church. 
And as I got deeper in the faith and as I became a strong Protestant and a strong evangelical, strong Christian, I realized the Catholic faith was the church that Jesus started and he wanted us to belong to one church. So the biggest draw to me and, and many of these that I speak to was we understood the Bible exegetically. And we knew in John chapter 6, when Jesus said, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have eternal life. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I will abide in you and you will abide in me. When you read those words exegetically in the Greek, there is no explanation other than Jesus said what he meant and meant what he said. And this symbolic teaching that so many non-Catholic Christians believe today is a false teaching. You know, you look at the first century, all the Christians believed this, all the way up to the 1500s, even Martin Luther believed that Jesus meant that when we have communion, it's supernaturally, the bread supernaturally turns in to Jesus's flesh, blood, and full divinity. So, so once I seen that, I, I, I wanted his flesh. I wanted his blood. I wanted life. I wanted him to abide in me in a deeper way than I've ever experienced. But I had one big hurdle. The biggest hurdle that I think most Protestants have is we know the Bible teaches we're taught we're saved by grace. And we had this false assumption that the Catholics taught you earn your salvation. Then studying church history, I came across the Catholic Church condemning this teaching. See, there was a man named Pelagius, and the teaching was Pelagianism, that taught you can earn your salvation apart from the grace of God. And the Catholic Church condemned this way back in the 5th century. They, they, they condemned this heresy. So today, I'm going to read you official Catholic documents that condemn this heresy that you can earn your salvation and proves the Catholic Church has always taught and still teaches today, we are saved by grace alone. So another, another exciting thing was, um, and this is all going to come together, and um, I should have quoted Dr. Peter Kripp because Dr. Peter Kripp said something so brilliantly. It was something that I understood, but, you know, Dr. Uh, Criff can put things so articulate <laughs> and make it so just point blank and like, wow. So I want to quote him. He said, the Protestant Reformation began when a Catholic monk discovered a Catholic doctrine in a Catholic book. The, doc the, the, the monk, of course, was Martin Luther. The doctrine was justification by faith. And the book was the Bible. So, how is this the how is it, well, we know everybody knows Martin Luther was Catholic, but why does he say the book was Catholic? Well, because it was the Catholic Church who decided which books would belong into the Bible. It didn't just fall out of the sky. There's no table of contents. I mean, that was added later. You know, when they added verses. You know, when the printing press became available in the 1600s, they started printing Bibles and put in verses and chapters and and table of contents. But no one knew the table of contents. But the Catholic Church knew, based on sacred tradition, inspired by the Holy Spirit. See, St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, I believe it's 2.15. Uh, yeah, 2.15. I wrote it down in case I forgot. <laughs> he told the Thessalonians to keep, hold fast, hold on to the traditions passed down from him and the other apostles. Passed down to him in, in written form and in verbal form. So verbally was passed down which books sh should be in the Bible. So this, this is how the Catholic Church knew at the Council of Rome, overseen by our Pope, so it was official. You know, I always hear things, well, it was just a, you know, a regional council, the whole Catholic Church. Didn't believe that. No, no. It was in Rome. The Pope approved it. It was official. Catholic teaching. 382 AD. The Catholic Church decided which books would be in the Bible. And you're like, well... Well, everybody knew which books would be in the Bible. It's self-evident. No, it wasn't self-evident. There were great books that many of the Christian leaders, the bishops at that time, thought belonged. Like the book, the letters from St. Clement, the, fifth, the fourth pope, who was discipled by the Apostle John. And there were, many, there were many others, you know, not many, but there were several others that were good, holy books and worthy of being read. 
but they weren't included because they weren't deemed inspired by God. And, um, and then at the Council of Rome, I mean, at the Council of uh, um, uh, Hippo, uh, 393 AD, those same books, what we call the canon of scripture, were deemed to, you know, affirm, yeah, yep, we agree. Uh, we just want to remind you guys, these are the, the books that are in the Bible that you can read in church. Uh, then the Council of Carthage, 397, and the Council of Carthage, 419. And then there was a huge ecumenical council. So these were regional councils just agreeing what the church should be reading. And it was agreeing with the Church of Rome in 382 AD because the church always believed that Rome was the head. So then the Council of Florence was ecumenical for all the world. And again, they agreed on the same books. And then the Council of Trent agreed and made it dogmatic. Like, yeah, this is it. This is like the most official way you can do it, but it's always been the teaching of the church. And I bring this up because I'm going to read one of these councils. Uh, and I bring this up because it is a Catholic book, because the Catholic church decided which books would be in the Bible. And it was 73 books. And when Martin Luther left the Catholic church and translated his own Bible in German, he took out seven and they still remain gone. But he also said the book of James, the book of Hebrews, the book of Revelation, the book of Jude weren't scriptural either. And the Protestant Bible translators since then disagreed with them. They kept the seven out, but thankfully they put the four back in that Luther said were not uh, inspired by God. So for 1,500 years, the church, based off uh, apostolic tradition passed down from the apostles, said 73 books were biblical. And one man said, no, the church was wrong. But how did the church to think about this? Okay, so if Martin Luther's right, they were wrong about the seven. How do we know they weren't wrong about the other 66? So anyway, it's a little off topic, but I just want to prove it is a Catholic book. And, and I'm reading from one of those councils. So in the Council of Carthage, which I'm reading from now, 419, there's about 100, I think 120 canons. So laws that the church is saying this is the rule. And Canon 24 is a list of the 73 books in the Bible. It's going way back, 419 AD. But we're talking about grace and condemning uh, the false doctrine that we can earn our salvation by works. And Canon 113 of the Catholic Council of Carthage says this. It seemed good that whosoever should say that the grace of justification was given to us only that we might be able more readily by grace to perform what we were ordered to do through our free will as though grace was not given although not easily yet nevertheless we could even without grace fulfill the divine commandments let him be anathema for the lord spoke concerning the fruits of the commandments when he said without me you can do nothing and not without me you could do it but with difficulty you see Pelagius taught that you could earn salvation without the grace of God. And when the church condemned that, you had other people which are known as semi-Pelagian says, well, you could do it, but it would be harder. And the church say, no, without Christ, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Not apart from me, you can do it more easily. So that's 419 AD. So then we go to uh, 529 AD to the Council of Orange. Now, there's 25 canons in there. This whole council was about the grace of God. So I'm not going to read all 25. I'm just going to read two quickly, canon 6 and 7. If anyone says that God has mercy upon us when, apart from his grace, we believe, will, desire, strive, labor, pray, watch, study, seek, ask, or knock, basically works, but does not confess that it is by the infusion and inspiration of the Holy Spirit within us, that we have the faith, the will, or the strength to do all these things as we ought. Or if anyone makes the assistance of grace depend on the humility or obedience of man, and does not agree that it is a gift of grace itself that we are obedient and humble, he contradicts the apostle who says, What have you that you did not receive? And, 
but by the grace of God, I am what I am. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 and 1 Corinthians 15, 10. And then Canon 7. If anyone affirms that we can form any right opinion or make any right choice which relates to the salvation of eternal life as is expedient for us, or that we can be saved, that is, assent to the preaching of the gospel through our natural powers, without the illumination and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who makes all men gladly assent to and believe in the truth, he is led astray by a heretical spirit and does not understand the voice of God who says in the gospel, for apart from me you can do nothing, James 15, 5, and the word of the apostle, not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, our competence is from God. And then you have uh, the Council of Trent in the 1500s. Canon number one. If anyone says that man can be justified before God by his own works, whether done by his own natural powers or through the teaching of the law, without divine grace through Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. And then... In 1999, the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church had a conversation. And they realized, like Peter Cripp points out in his, his, uh, his whole essay, actually has an essay about what I just said, you know, the, the Reformation was started by a Catholic monk who discovered a Catholic doctrine in a Catholic book. He gives a whole essay and said, the past 500 years, the Reformation was based on a misunderstanding. So they fixed that misunderstanding. And I'm going to explain to you what the misunderstanding was in a minute. But the Joint Declaration of Faith, which I got off the Vatican website, you can find it there. I'm just going to go, there's different, uh, pa I guess, paragraphs. So I'm going to go to paragraph 15. It says this. In faith, we together, Lutherans and Catholics, hold the conviction that justification is the work of the triune God. The Father sent his Son into the world to save sinners. The foundation and presupposition of justification is the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. Justification thus means that Christ himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. Together we confess by grace alone in faith in Christ's saving work and not because of any merit on our part we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works this is why Pope Francis said this I think that the intentions of Martin Luther were not mistaken he was a reformer Perhaps some methods were not correct, but in that time, if we read the story of the pastor, a German Luther, who then converted when he saw reality, he became Catholic. In that time, the church was not exactly a model to imitate. There was corruption in the church. There was worldliness, attachment to money, to power, and this he protested. Then he was intelligent and took some steps forward justifying, and because he did this, and today Lutherans and Catholics... Protestants, all of us agree on the doctrine of justification. On this point, which is very important, he did not err. He made a medicine for the church. So although the Pope admits he made a lot of mistakes, he's saying on this point he did not. Now, of course, a lot of people took Pope Francis out of context, like they always do. And they actually said, Pope Francis said, Martin, he, he's quoting Martin Luther saying we're saved by faith alone. He's saying Martin Luther was, was right by saying we're saved by faith alone. He never said that faith alone. He never says that in this. He's saying justification. The Joint Declaration on Justification, 1999, I guess uh, St. John Paul II, Pope John Paul II was Pope at the time when that was signed. So we're saved by grace alone that lead us to good works. This is an important part point because Protestant and Christians agree we're saved by grace alone, through faith. Now, Martin Luther added alone to faith as well as grace. But the Bible never taught that. And so 
there's a misunderstanding and I'm going to explain this misunderstanding. And if you're a thinking Protestant, you, you'll, you'll get it. So, um, Martin Luther read Romans 3.28. Now you have to remember, Luther were guided, was guided to, to Romans by a Catholic priest. You know, his confessor knew that Luther was very legalistic, very hard on himself. He couldn't accept the grace of God. He couldn't accept God's mercy. He had very mean parents, and he looked at God as like a mean ogre. And he's like, Luther, read the book of Romans and ask God to show you. So he read the book of Romans, and he discovered, like Dr. Peter Cripps says, a Catholic doctrine. And it was Romans 3.28 that stood out to him. For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And he's right. That's what the Bible says. But Luther added the word alone. And again, like the Protestant Bible translators put the four books back in the Bible in the New Testament that Luther disagreed with. They also never added the word alone like he did. So it's not in any Protestant Bible, thank God. But Luther literally added to the Bible. He wrote, for we, for we hold that a man is justified by faith, and he put alone, apart from works of the law. The only place in the Bible where the words faith and alone are is James 2.24. When James says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So Luther seen that as a contradiction and said the book of James is a book of straw. It should be thrown into the furnace. It should be thrown into the fire. It's not biblical. It's not inspired. It has nothing to do with the Bible because it contradicts Paul. Because he couldn't understand the church's teaching. Paul was addressing the new converts. It's by grace alone through faith. James was addressing converts, that Christians. Or you're already saved. You see, because up until a few years ago, the church, no one in the church ever thought you couldn't lose your salvation. Once saved, always saved is a kind of a new thing within Christianity. So he wasn't talking about getting saved. He was talking about walking with the Lord, persevering, running the race, fighting the fight, working out one's own salvation by the grace of God. And, 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 and point number two that Luther misunderstood, he was separate. And what, what a lot of uh, Protestants and I did it myself, we would separate faith and works like they're two different things. But James didn't separate it. James says, if, if you go down to uh, 226, for as the body, this is James 226, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. He was talking, they're one. So I have a, I have a spirit and have a body. But if you shoot me and I die and my spirit leaves my body, what good is my body? That's what James is saying. You can't separate your faith and works. And if you back up um, 2.18, James 2.18, he, he, he explains it. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. He's saying, no, it's, it's not like that. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I, by my works, will show you my faith. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish fellow, that apart from... That faith apart from works is barren. Is barren. So what James was teaching was faith and works is one. But what the Bible and what the Catholic Church I just read you have always taught was you can't even have faith or works without the grace of God. It's the grace of God comes first, the grace of God. And, and, I, and I could have kept reading in the Canons of Orange, it says, you wouldn't even think about having faith in God without the grace of God. You wouldn't even think about praying without the grace of God. You wouldn't even think about repenting without the grace of God. It's all grace, grace alone that leads us. So, and, and, and when James says, you know, we're saved by works, not by faith alone, he's not talking about works of the law. No, what works is he talking about? Acts chapter 2, let me read it to you. Now, when the, this is Peter preaching his first sermon after he was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. It says, now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? 
And Peter told them, just believe, brother. No. Peter said, repent. So it's not faith alone. It's faith. But faith that causes you to repent. Repent and be baptized. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves us. Even Martin Luther believed that. Even Martin Luther believed you could lose your salvation. See, this is why he was confused. Baptism now saves us. 1 Peter 3.21. So repent. So just like the Jews, when a Jew got circumcised, that was his way of becoming part of the kingdom of God. Baptism brings you into the kingdom of God today. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. And you shall receive the gifts of his Holy Spirit, the promises to you and to your children and to all that are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls them. This is why the early church has always baptized children and infants. We believe in grace. So even an infant who cannot do any good works can be saved by grace. That's how powerful the grace of God is. And this is why the church has always baptized infants. And, and, and I know if you're a Bible alone, you don't care about church history. You don't care about history. All you want to see is, is in the Bible. And it doesn't specifically say that they baptize infants like that. But the church has always baptized infants. If you just look at history, because of the grace of God and because of the promises to you and to your family. So when we, when James says we're saved, we're justified by works apart, apart, uh, we're justified by works and not by faith alone. He's not talking about works of the law. The church is never talking about works of the law. We're talking about repentance, works of love. Jesus says at the last days, there'll be the goats and the sheep. And I'll ask, you know, I'll tell him, you know, you gave me water when I was thirsty. You gave me food when I was hungry. And they'll ask me, when did I do that? And I'll say, when you did to the least, you did to me, go to heaven. And they'll tell the goats, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't drink. You didn't give me no drink. You're going to hell. He never mentioned their faith. He mentioned their works. So this is why the church the fullness of the gospel, what we call it, the whole gospel, teaches the whole thing. But it's by grace that you want to do those works. So apart from grace, you can do nothing. This is what the church has always taught. Even today, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2010 says, Since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification. See, this is what I'm saying. Paul was talking about the initial grace. James was talking about once you're saved, walking with the Lord, you know, and, and, and it goes on to speak about that moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit and by charity, love, we can then merit for ourselves and for others. And it says, oh, you see, you can merit for yourself. So no, no, no. By the grace of God, with the Holy Spirit in us, with love, the love of God, the grace of God, we can do Again, the councils and the church has always said, and the Bible says, we can do nothing apart from the grace of God. But then, um, and, uh, we can then merit for ourselves and for others the grace is needed for our sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, increase of love, and for the attainment of eternal life. Even temporal goods like health and friendship can be merited in accordance with God's wisdom. How? These graces and goods are the object of Christian prayer. Prayer attends to the grace we need for meritorious uh, actions. So if you don't believe that, then why even pray? <laughs> if you don't believe that by God's grace, he can give you faith to pray for your health, pray for other people's health. Why ask, you know, when someone's sick, hey, can you pray for my brother? He's sick. This is That's all that's talking about. But always, 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 it's the grace of God precedes merit. The merits, God's merits, not ours. We can do nothing apart from God. And like I said, read the whole Council of, of Orange, and and I could I could I could do a whole video on just that because it tells us that we wouldn't even want to pray, we wouldn't want to repent, we wouldn't want to believe, except for the grace of God, and we can do nothing to earn it, not our humility, not our obedience, nothing. It's God's grace that comes to us. This is the grace of God that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. 
And you may say, well, once, once, once I accept the grace of God, it's once saved, always saved, you know? Jesus said, no one can snatch me out of my Father's hand. And let me just, Dale, Dale Moody, I'm going to read the late Dale Moody. He was a Baptist scholar, and uh, they didn't like what he had to say, so he was kind of forced to retire. Uh, he was a theology teacher at one of their universities. He explains it very well. He says, advocates of perseverance of the saints, once saved, always saved, work with the false assumption that the adjective eternal is an adverb, as if it says the brother eternally has life. It is the life that is eternal, not one's possession of it. Eternal life is the life of God in Christ, the Son of God. And this life is lost when we depart from Christ. And the, uh, the Apostle Paul explains it this way. The book of Hebrews explains it this way. It is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, so someone who's saved, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. So they have the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they then commit apostasy, since they crucify the Son of God on their own account and hold him up to contempt. Hebrews 6, 4, 6. It is impossible to restore again to repentance those who become apostates. Now, apostate is total is total uh, repudiation of the Christian faith as defined by the Catholic Church. So, God keeps us with his grace, you know, but we do have free will to turn away, to turn completely away. So, Again, when Paul is talking about being saved by faith, amen, the Catholic Church saying it's grace alone that gives us the faith to be saved. And when James is saying we're justified by works and not by faith alone, James 24, he's talking about those Christians who are living in sin. He's warning Christians who's saying, I'm like Joe Biden, <laughs> who says he's a Catholic, or, or Bill Clinton, who says he's a Southern Baptist, you know? It's like, yo, bro, you say you got faith. Show me your faith, and I'll show you my works. Even the demons believe, brother. This is who he's talking about, men like that, who are openly sinning, you know, that don't know Christ, that are apart from Christ. So the Catholic Church does teach we are saved by grace alone through faith, just not faith alone. And, you know, Martin Luther actually believed you could lose your salvation. Martin Luther actually believed we're saved with baptism. He believed 1 Peter 3.21 where it says baptism now saves us. But he thought that was all part of faith. He didn't consider it, it a works. You know, evangelical faith has become a symbolic faith. You know, Jesus said, this is my flesh, this is my body. And I seen the movie about uh, Greg Laurie and they actually took that verse out of context and said, this is a symbol of my flesh and body, my body and blood. No, the Bible says this is my body to blood. And the Greek words are clear. He's talking about his flesh and blood. There's no other. He's using a Greek word that clearly means his flesh and blood. And when he says eat, he's clearly talking about eating on his body, eating his body and drinking his blood. And he doubles down and triples down in John 6. If you understand how to read the Bible exegetically and you know how to Google the Greek, you will see what I'm telling you is true. This is why so many on fire evangelical Christians are now on fire Catholic Christians. So remember, it's by grace we are saved through faith. And brother, come home to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The one church Jesus started in Matthew 16, 18 and 19 when he said to Peter, you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And what you Bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And what you, Peter, loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And we have that succession from Peter to Linus to Cletus to Clement all the way to Pope Francis. 266 Pope. This is historic. This is church history. And not only that, but every bishop in the Catholic Church can trace his lineage down to an apostle. This is the church that Jesus started. This is the church he wanted to be part of so become catholic and stay catholic and whether you do that or not if you're a christian 
You know, life is sacred and God created every life. So please, please support the pro-life movement by going to realestateforlife.org. If you're buying or selling real estate, it's not going to cost you anything. The commission and fees you would pay anyway will go to a pro-life Christian real estate company that donates a major portion of the money to pro-life causes. God bless and stay Catholic.